Hey, we're hitting record. Say, hello and welcome to our Poetry as Healing um, writing workshop. My name is Sean, I'm gonna be the MC, but actually I'm just introducing Brittany. That's literally all I do in the um, So, first I'm gonna start off with our mission statement and then make a couple announcements and then we'll introduce Britt. Um, and then she'll take it away. So, scrolling. Um, our Helicon West writing workshops are a live reading series that brings published local writers to read and write alongside commu community members in an open, uncensored forum. In order to promote the voice of every community member and democratic ideals, we honor all levels of skill, ability, and craft. We invite and celebrate aspiring writers from every walk of life to find and share their voices with us. We are committed to the causes of inclusion, accessibility, and re representation in our writing community. Helicon West operates on the territory of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation, whose people have been living, working, and residing on this land from time immemorial. We acknowledge that these lands carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. We recognize elders past and present as peoples who've cared for and continue to care for the land. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous self-governance, history, experiences, and resiliency of the native people who are still here today. I would like to thank our sponsors, um, the Logan Library, Sugar House Review, the Utah Humanities, the USU English Department, and our founder and matron, Star Saint, Star Colbrook, who is here with us, and we love seeing her every time she's here. Um, if you would like to read during the open mic after the workshop, there's a sign-up sheet by the coffee. The coffee is provided by the Logan Library, and it's free to all of you, um, so help yourself. Um, all of our Helicon West events are recorded right over there. If you decide to read during the open mic and don't want to be recorded, note it on the sign-up sheet or just tell either myself or Josh and we'll stop recording and then we'll start once you're done. Um, how this is going to work is Brittany is going to lead us for 10 to 15 minutes in uh, just teaching us about poetic healing. She'll give us some prompts and then for 30 minutes we'll have time to write together and then it will end with the open mic. Um, and then our announcements. Helicon West is made possible by our generous sponsors and by the community we serve. This is where I shill and say if you have pocket change, we have a tip jar and you're welcome to donate. We love donations. Um, the other announcement is that on August 24th, Alex and Sarah will be our featured readers and will be right up there on, at the USU Amphitheater. Um, so if you want to come back to Helicon, our featured readers are right here. They're great. Very excited to hear from them. Um, and I think that's all. So now Brittany is, uh, I have an official bio, but I'm just going to introduce you. Do it! Brittany and I have been friends for years now. Brittany is one of the best poets that I know. We have a lot of really good poets in this valley, but, um, no one can get an image quite like Brittany. That's what I'll say. Your imagery is so phenomenal. Um, she's also the former coordinator of Helicon West and is the reason that you have to deal with me now. Um, so, we love Brittany a lot, and here she is. Yay. Taco. I know. Taco, your life is hard. Come here. Taco. This is his first Helicon West. He's doing his best. Taco. Hey, Taco. Taco, come here. Sean said is Britt Allen. This is Taco. As I said, this is his first Helicon West. He's six months old and if he barks, we're gonna ignore him. Okay, we're, we're untraining the attention barking. Um, someone needs to do that to me too. But um, So first of all, um, I guess, I mean Sean introduced me pretty well. I've been here. I'm from Cache Valley. I went to USU. I got my BA and my MA from Utah State in creative writing. Shannon Ballum was my thesis chair um, for my, my master's thesis, which then got published as a poetry chapbook by Finishing Line Press. Um, and when Sean invited me, like way back in like May, 
he said, Britt, do you want to do a, you know, a, a writing workshop in the summer in August? I was like, yeah. And he's like, cool, just let me know what about. And I said, okay. And then I, and then I never told him what I wanted to do. And then he finally like hounded me. He's like, Britt, I need to get the summer schedule out. And I said, okay. Uh, and I was like, what do, what do I want to like do more of? And what do I want to focus more on? And so poetic healing, right? Um, is something I'm never like not interested in. Um, so I, I went for that and as I kind of dug into it and, and got ready for tonight, it turns out there was a lot, there's, <laughs> there's a lot more. There's whole entire books like written on the subject, right? Um, and when I double checked with Sean how much time I had and he said 10 to 15 minutes, I was like, oh no, you know, and here I am squandering the first three minutes telling you all about how hard it is to tell you in 12 minutes about poetic healing. But so please just understand these are the barest of bones. Um, I've done kind of my best to, to give us like a, a charcuterie board of examples of, of what I'm talking about. And then I put together, um, there's four, four exercise options on page three and on the back are, are my sources, right? And also recommended reading if this strikes a chord, if you want to know more about this. I'm also going to be operating from, from the assumption that you came here because you are also interested in poetic healing, right? I don't really need to defend to you why poetry over other forms, um, but I am gonna blab at you my thoughts about why poetry over other forms. And first, um, disclaimer number one, just, just also very broadly, um, I felt it prudent to say writing um, while therapeutic is not is not therapy, right? And therapy isn't writing too. Um, it that street works both ways. But if you choose to write about something extreme tonight, or like something extreme bubbles up inside of you, right? Please know that you do not have to share it at all with the group, um, especially if if it is like very physically and viscerally triggering for you. I would recommend you know sharing it outside the group perhaps with someone you pay to like sit and listen to you for you know 60 minutes or so I have some recommendations but <laughs> um, if you do write about something um, that that could be potentially upsetting to someone else in the space tonight um, I would also appreciate just kind of a content warning for everyone just in the interest of consensual listening so that we can all continue to feel safe in this space yep. groovy okay uh, disclaimer two, <laughs> why poetry? I think for me, when, as a creative writer, I've been writing my whole life, right? But, and, I, and I did my middle school poetry. Oh my Lord, did I do middle school poetry. And I wrote sex poems about tomatoes. It was a blast. Anyway, that sounds weird, but I just sexualized this tomato. I wasn't having sex with the tomato, but it doesn't matter. Um, I mean, it does matter, actually. It's recorded it somewhere. It's it? recorded yeah. everywhere. Sure yeah, it's on like at least a couple of places, because I read it at the birthday party, yeah. too. But anyway, um, I was really primarily a fiction writer until I got to college, interestingly enough. I, I was writing stories, I was writing a lot of fantasy stories even, um, but just a lot of short stories. I was really into zombies my senior year of high school, like obsessed, right? And I wrote a whole research paper about that in English 2010, respect, loved it. But when I got to USU <laughs> and I started taking poetry classes, right, um, I found a way to me, poems often feel like windows into this other place where even pain is beautiful, right? So poems can be a snapshot of the most horrendous thing. It can be a snapshot of, of, of a death or an abuse, right? And it's somehow made beautiful. It's somehow made lyric, right? The writer has somehow taken a shitty event, right? I've written a poem about cleaning my grandma's literal shit up off of a department store floor, right? And cleaning up after her when she had an accident. Um, and I could take that event and I could, I could exercise just this really, hi Millie, I love you. This really brand new level of control over the narrative, right? Because it wasn't just the narrative, but it became about my word choice. It became about my word order. It became about the sounds. It became about the line breaks, right? It became, is this a run-on sentence or is it choppy, right? Um, and so I guess, um, I don't know, when it comes to the, as I write here, the messy business of healing, I find poetry to be a really effective and really empowering tool. 
um, to kind of take these, these messy, unspeakable bits and make something artful out of it, right? Fiction can too, nonfiction can as well. I'm, I'm assuming we're all here because we're all interested in doing it poetically, right? Which is, which is my preferred way of doing it. Any thoughts or questions? Okay, we're gonna jump right in then. So my first example, I'm gonna read um, out loud myself. It's titled, I Give You Back by Joy Harjo. She was the Poet Laureate of the United States for many years. I release you my beautiful and terrible fear. I release you. You were my beloved and hated twin, but now I don't know you as myself. I release you with all the pain I would know at the death of my children. You are not my blood anymore. I give you back to the soldiers who burned down my home, beheaded my children, raped and sodomized my brothers and sisters. I give you back to those who stole the food from our plates when we were starving. I release you, fear, because you hold these scenes in because you hold these scenes in front of me, and I was born with eyes that can never close. I release you, I release you, I release you, I release you. I am not afraid to be angry. I am not afraid to rejoice. I am not afraid to be black. I am not afraid to be white. I am not afraid to be hungry. I am not afraid to be full. I am not afraid to be hated. I am not afraid to be loved, to be loved, to be loved, fear. Oh, you have choked me, but I gave you the leash. You have gutted me, but I gave you the knife. You have devoured me, but I laid myself across the fire. I take myself back, fear. You are not my shadow any longer. I won't hold you in my hands. You can't live in my eyes, my ears, my voice, my belly, or in my heart, my heart, my heart, my heart. But come here, fear. I am alive and you are so afraid of dying. What, <clears throat> what did you notice? I'm also mimicking Star and Shannon's Poet Laureate styles, so this is <laughs> gonna be highly participatory. <laughs> The repetition. And what effect does it have, Shannon? Um, it just hits you over the head and it makes it more powerful. Yes, yep, the repetitions hit you over the head, make it more powerful. They kind of build on themselves, right? On itself, I release you, I release you, I release you. My heart, my heart, my heart. It also kind of reminds me of affirmations. Like you quote the artist's way um, in here and she does a lot with affirmations and letting go of fear feels like something that you would need to keep reminding yourself that you're doing affirming that you're letting go i think the repetition is really powerful in that way too right yeah affirmations i've never been told to use affirmations in a self-harming kind of way right yeah, yeah. <laughs> not yet Other thoughts? Maybe answers to the other questions at the bottom. Yeah, so the fear, in inviting the fear back, literally inviting the fear back at the end, pre, pre you know, supposes it, it has something to do with 
the not ever being able to completely like release it, right? It also sort of shifts the power dynamic, right? Now the fear isn't over her, but she almost has some, some sort of authority over the fear, right? Or at least autonomy. Yes. Right? It's written in a tender tone. And how can we tell this is written in a tender tone, too? And what was your name? Snow. Snow? Nice to meet you, Snow. What are the lines doing? We've got the repetition, right? Almost like a heartbeat. Very comforting, very reassuring, very affirmative. language like, for sure. Right. Yeah, yeah, good point. So again, the, the word choice, right, in poetry is very, very intentional, right, especially a repeated word very, very thought through, very, like, chewed upon before landing on the final version of the poem. Yeah, there's a lot. Okay. Wood. Ugh. I don't have a ton of time. Um, in the, in the writing time, I strongly encourage you to read The Thing Is by Ellen Bass and also Jam Crammed Dam by Anne Harrington. They'll give, they'll give examples of kind of what some of the other poems or the prompts are asking us to do. But I'm gonna ask us all to switch to page three, one, two, three, four, to radiology report real quick. And I'll read this one and then we'll go to the prompts. Do we have another copy? Are we out? Okay. Can we get one down to Aaron over there? Thank you so much for sharing. Okay. So radiology report by Suzanne Peterman. Routine mediolateral oblique and craniocaudad views were performed. A suggestion of a mass. A suggestion of a mass in the lower right breast corresponds to the palpable lump. This non-specific finding is most likely benign. However, ultrasound demonstrates a well-defined echo, a well-defined echo at approximately five o'clock. What is this poem doing to us? Putting the fear back. Putting the fear back? It back yeah. How is it putting it back, bro? Well, it's at the end. We've all defined that goes probably 5 o'clock. We don't know what that means, but it doesn't sound good. Yeah, it's kind of doomy, huh? 5 o'clock, it ends on a time. It ends on a timeline. It ends on, like, yeah, the implication of specificity, of finality, of a finish line. Yeah. Gotcha. Super destabilizing, yeah. Which speaks loudly, right, to the way perhaps the poet felt about it. The abrupt end gives you a lot of doubt. Right. Totally divine, benign, but old. A well-defined echo. A well-defined echo, right? It's gonna live in your head. It's like a haunting echo of itself. Absolutely. 
Uh, so I picked this poem to also read together because it's, it's very obviously very different in terms of line break, right? In terms of, there's no I, right? There, there's not even, the speaker is suspiciously like absent. There's no pronouns throughout. It's almost disembodied, right? It's happening to something or someone. There's no agency, there's no I. And I also picked this, this poem to also go over because unlike I give you back, there's, there's less of a resolution, right? There is no, I release you, but come here, right? I will be bigger, you know, I will, I will comfort my fear. There is no, I will comfort this maybe breast cancer, this radiology report in here. But do we think that perhaps the author got a, I'm trying to, I'm trying to phrase this without leading you to the answer I want you to say. Um, <laughs> do you think the author got benefit from writing it? Do you think it was healing regardless? I think being with uncertainty can be healing, just allowing it, like having it on the page, like being yeah. uncertainty in an eye poem can be yeah. healing. For sure, yeah, being with uncertainty can, can be healing, for sure. A form of acceptance, also putting it into words and putting it out, right? Having your uncertainty be witnessed connects you to other people. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it makes the radiology report into an object to be examined, for sure, which is a form of othering, which is, you know, a form of processing, too. Absolutely. Again, I wish I had hours and decades with you all to kind of go over the, the nitty gritty of like poetic devices, right? We could use, we could talk about line breaks and, and simile and metaphor and, you know, assonance and consonance and, and punctuation, right? We can, we can look at all these examples, um, but we don't have that much time. Plus we want to prioritize giving you all time to write tonight as well. Otherwise it would just be a lecture and I'm not getting paid to do that. So, <laughs> but please read the other examples. Um, but now I'm going to point us to the exercises on the back. I believe we will have like 20 to 30 minutes of free writing time. So you might get through, maybe you try tackling all of them, right? Or maybe you just pick one and you know, some poems will come out short and hard and fast. My poems tend to do that. And maybe you tackle the prompt again, right? Or maybe you move on to the next one, or maybe you find like the perfect prompt and you kind of slit your guts and they just start spilling and spilling and spilling and you don't even finish it tonight. That's amazing too. I want all of it to happen to all of you. But, um, so these exercises I got from Poetic Medicine, The Healing Art of Poem Making by John Fox, which again, Shannon introduced me to. So um, it's one of my recommended readings in the back. The first one is titled, Reclaiming Feelings. Consider those times when you shut off your feelings of sadness in order to appear fine, either to yourself or to others. Or, if your tendency is to inhibit feelings of joy and delight, write about that process. What image or metaphor, metaphor just being like um, imagistic language, where it, it would be like, instead of Brittany is, is, I don't know, like a brick house, it would just be Brittany is a brick house, right? Like, anyway, <laughs> metaphor. If, if anyone has questions on, on vocabulary, please flag me down. But, um, what image or metaphor describes the experience, I just called myself a bird house, describes the experience of suppressing your feelings? What image or metaphor could illustrate giving those feelings more room? Without allowing the emotion to overwhelm you, what would giving your feelings more room in your life look like? Make a poem about this. Exercise two and three, the power of healing metaphors. One, think of an area in your life where you need sustenance at work, at home with family, taking care of an aging parent in a relationship. Make two columns. Jot down that area of stress in the left column. In include a few notes on that stress, difficult memories or circumstances, how your body feels in that place or, or circumstance, qualities of relationships, etc. For instance, if, if the issue was at work, work past dinner time, furrowed brow, deadlines on my desk, 
competitive coworker. In the second column, write words, images, and metaphors that nourish you. Take words from each of these columns and link them together in a poem. How can the nourishing words be applied to ease the stressful ones? Two, use the words below or others to express metaphorically aspects of yourself, something in your life or someone you know. There's a whole word, word list. And the final one is playing with line breaks and line lengths. Experiment with putting different emotions into poetic lines. Anger, delight, and sadness. How would they look on the page, right? How would, how would your poem be shaped if it was one written in anger versus one written in sadness versus one written in delight? Do a free write paragraph, a free write in paragraph form focusing on one emotion and an incident that evoked it, right? Linking that emotion to specific events. Don't think so much about the content of your writing right now. Next, break your free write piece up into the shape of sadness. Focus on the feeling. What shape does the feeling of your sadness have in poetic lines? How does it move? Where do the lines break? Go back and develop the content of your feeling poem when you have found a shape that feels right. So the last one kind of focuses more on like appearance of poem rather than content of poem. Um, just to like kind of get you started and playing with shapes, which would be a little harder to demonstrate tonight. But. Any questions for me before we get to writing? Why do you say you're a good house? <laughs> uh, be, because I'm tough. <laughs> because I'm tough. Okay, <laughs> you'll have 25 minutes to write, so 7.55 is when we'll get back together for the open mic. for the open mic. Before we get started, there are a couple of guidelines that we have for the open mic. It's uncensored, so get ready, buckle up. It's gonna be great. Um, you also only have seven minutes. If you go over seven minutes, you'll be politely clapped off of this area, and you'll have to go sit back down. Um, so, just be ready to be clapped off if you're feeling long-winded tonight. And I think that's everything. Also recording. If you don't wanna be recorded, let us know and we will hit the no longer recording button until you're off the stage. Um, other than that, we'll go in sets of three. That's me speaking optimistically because right now we only have two people. But if anybody else would like to read at the open mic, just let me know. Um, but we'll get started with Jay and then Snow. I would prefer if this is not filmed. This was maybe a prompt. <laughs> it started with metaphor, um, and I don't know where it went. And then I am also going to totally break the rules and read something that I wrote long ago and have read to some of you before, but still can't get it out of my head. So we're gonna we're gonna do our best. The first one um, tonight is about longing. Adrift in this ocean floats my stiffened heart aching from every headfirst crash into another wave. No smooth glide over for her, skimming the surface as she drowns in salt, in water. In salt and water, she's blinded by sparkling sun on every crest, yet desperate to see the pulsing vibrancy of marine life below. Minnows light scattering scales, sleek mollusk and fuchsia coral calling out but she cannot hear. Her sense of sight is lost in the blinding reflection of sun on sea. Sun lost at sea, sun at sea, a sea sun leaves nothing else to see. And then, um, this is the one I wrote a while ago. It's called My Shaking Hands. Everyone wants to whisper words of wisdom, comfort to their minds now that you're gone. You're still so young, you've got your whole life ahead of you. You'll find someone else and love again. They pass out hugs like expired hard candy on Halloween without realizing what bitterness seeps out with each bite. Suffocating scented clouds surround as they lean in, expecting me to cling to them with bated breath, savior that they are 
How gracious of them to whittle away my pain with advice, to belittle away my sane with their eyes. Before you know it, you won't even remember him. And now the hurt I tightly spooled, spun so strict to restrict any possibility of release. Our lease, our lease is up, unfurls uncontrollably, scattering skeins faster than I can gather the threadbare remnants to my chest. Gaping chest split wide, wide gaping wound, aching for shivering hands who would sew it back up. They don't see the blood dripping down my sides, down my thighs. They don't see that their words might work, might erase the knife. The knife I drive ever deeper, desperate to lock it between muscle and bone. Lodge it tight, keep that shimmery silver nestled in the gristle. Keep that thistle inside and I can never forget your voice, your eyes the soft fallen rise of your breath on my neck. Morning murmurs, shaking sleep from dream-drenched lids that flutter. Stay with me a moment longer, my darling. Steady my hand as I grasp this handle. They speak to the future, but I speak to you. Let this be anything. Anything, let this be. Let us be, let us be anything. Anything, let's be anything but a memory. Posterity, that was a hard <laughs> word. I'm Kate. And, our, and Shannon? Kate. That gives us a set of three and more, so um, <laughs> that's exciting. But we'll start with Pam, and then Britt, and then Star, and then Shannon. I'll just cheat and do four. <laughs> this is from the prompt, The Power of Healing Metaphors. Last month, I watered the green plants on my front porch with fresh tears. No water shortage here as my flowers reached toward the summer sun. I shed all anger and frustration as I dived into the pool. All feelings of inadequacy dissolved in the clear water. My smile reflected my joy of being an aqua babe at Logan Aquatic Center. <laughs> I start each summer weekday morning with laughter and aerobics, punching the water. At home, I read and write on my front porch with a small audience of hummingbirds. They consume the sugar I am trying desperately to stay away from. For them, it is energy, not for me. <laughs> not necessarily alone with my thoughts, I can talk to the hummingbirds, read aloud my anxious thoughts, and release them into the summer breeze. Another thunderstorm quiets my loneliness. You love poetry. Come on, back up. Oh, God, you're tight to my pants. Let's go this way. <laughs> Thank you. This first poem, I've got a couple. This first one is one I referenced earlier when I was talking about uh, my grandmother's accident. Um, so I'll read that one. And then one I wrote yesterday while getting all these um, prompts together. So the first one is titled Gratitude, a Prayer. My grandmother shit herself at the department store, waiting for me to get back with an associate with the bathroom code. She whimpered my name as thick shit slid down her loose pant leg. Thank God I took her shopping that day. Not the neighbor, not my father. 
thank God for linoleum and tile and the alcove in the back of the store away from other shoppers. Thank God for the associate who said nothing when she rounded the corner and saw the yellow brown puddle. Thank God the store sold wet wipes. Thank God she had spare pants and underwear, carried them around in her purse. Thank God my sister came with us, gagging but ferrying in and out of the women's restroom. Thank God for the woman and her toddler who came and went without a word about the sour squash smell. Thank God for toilet seat covers, better than paper towels because they were flushable. Thank God the sinks had handles and not sensors so I could flush her shoes with hot water, watching toilet paper stuck to shit stuck to her naked heel under the stall door. Thank God the handicap stall was empty. Thank God again for wet wipes with which I gently erased my grandmother's insides from the toilet's outsides. Thank God for whoever held my gag reflex as I bent to the ground and did what was before me to be done, scooping the soft earth of my grandmother. Um, and then this first draft that I wrote yesterday, um, just kind of with all the prompts ticking around inside me, it's, called, it's currently titled Graceful. All day long, I dragged my grief behind me, heavy as a waterlogged corpse tied to my throat with a hook. I have been the graceful woman. I made it easy for you to come, easy for you to leave each time you decided you had tried hard enough. I have laid my body on the tracks of the trolley problem for you, folded my love into a square small enough to spit your gum. Always you are stunned because I am kind. I have been silent for you, hot for you, wise for you, soft and sweet and raw. I will be mad now instead, hook clenched between my teeth. I will tear the tenderness from my soft tissue. I will murder the woman you never loved well. <laughs> In the chair sits the bear, the three-shirt bear, made of his denim favorites, made by his cousin, his favorite cousin, who makes them, these bears, from the favorite clothes of the deceased. She makes them for the funeral home. His bear, he chose the shirts from where he lay in the bed, the hospital bed that was placed by the hospice company next to our bed, our bed, where we lay together for only two years, the bed we chose to fit in the bedroom we built together over the pandemic, while he was not yet dying and could build the walls, cut and fit the trim. His cousin cut and fit the fabric of the shirts he chose as he was dying, sent me running from closet to closet to find the faded Harley shirt, he said, don't use the Harley stuff, just the fabric with the triple stitching sent me to find his most faded plain denim, sent me to find his blue-white sage flannel, ordered his cousin to make a vest, make it with snaps down the front. She did it in a day and a half, brought it back, set it next to him in the bed where he didn't wake again before his death. The three-shirt bear, with triple stitching, tailored vest, and snaps down the front, sits in the chair in the corner where they took away the hospital bed, where I sleep in the bed we used to share, and our dog sleeps in his bed, one of us on either side of that blue shirt bear who looks at us with his glass black eyes that absorb and reflect our first waking knowledge of morning before we get up and our last thought of evening, before we lie down. The bear has a heart stitched on its left sole, Dixie Joe's trademark, 
her heart stuffed into its chest, our hearts tucked into the corner. Difficulty walking, moving like a glacier, eyes slow and blue, muscle pain and stiffness in my hamstring and calf, fear that I'm never, never going to fully recover, fear of failure, fear of losing out on the crimson trail where the steer's heads bloom in the gully in spring and the one-sided miter wart blooms in summer. I haven't seen any leopard lilies this year or last. I'm worried that I will never see them again. Oh, fountain, heal me. Oh, jasmine and ashes and wind, heal me. The stroke, the stroke, the central part of my life that I have to live with day in and day out. In the morning, I wake up and st I still have a stroke. I go to bed at night and still have a stroke. Oh, fountain of snow, nourish me. Shadow and water, nourish me. Moon, nourish me. I desire to be healed, but I don't know if or when. The uncertainty is harming me. Maybe I'll walk barefoot with a three pound, three pound weight around my ankle. Maybe I'll do ladders. Maybe I'll do my step routine. But how can I go on? I must go on. I must. Too many people are counting on me. I need to count on myself. A stroke is a vice of knives, a prison of wind, a mask of stone. Jasmine wind, heal me, heal me, heal me. Next we have Jan, and I'll check. Is there anybody else? Okay. I did mine from the second metaphor, or the second exercise also. But the microphone just tipped it. There you go. Yeah. Is that better? Uh-huh. Okay. Mine is called Alone. Unmoored from companionship, moving through a morass of stigmatization. What's wrong with her? What's her problem? And why is she so long? Longing to belong, writhing to be of worth, hiding in the shadows of shame. Bitter, hurt, bitter. Bitter, pitied, bitter. Bitter, betrayed, bitter, bitter, brittle, bitter, alone. Hey, I'm gonna assume that's everybody. Um, thank you to all of our open mic readers. Uh, thank you to Brittany for these excellent prompts and for that time. And thank you for gathering together in this space of community. 
Um, I love having the opportunity to write with all of you in this, this sense of community and sharing. So thank you for being here tonight. Um, and hopefully we will see you all in two weeks up at the amphitheater for Alex and Sarah's uh, featured reading. Um, have a good night, everybody.